At this point, you may be wondering what kinds of companies are operating in the fintech space. But before we talk specific companies out there in fintech, we're going to draw some broad strokes categories around them as there are several various players in the mix. So first up are our legacy institutions. These are the incumbents in the world of financial services from big institutionalized banks from Barclays to Chase to the National Bank of Cambodia. Banks are really trying to roll and change with the times now. Um, as we've talked about before, big banks have always offered a huge, large array of services under one sun, um, checking, savings, credit. And so banks are trying to figure out now how to stay competitive against more niche consumer focused disruptors. Um, and they're actually digitizing and expanding their services by integrating with those very fintechs to provide either the infrastructure or that hot new innovation that they've been looking for. Now, of course, big tech is up next. Um, your fangs of the world, so your Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Googles are getting involved in fintech too, becoming active in the payments vertical with peer to peer payments over social and email. Google Pay and Alipay are digital wallet platforms for contactless, contactless payments. Facebook is going live, apparently, with their digital currency Diem this Q1, which rebranded from Libra and is launching as a stable coin, which is a type of cryptocurrency whose value is tied to an uh, outside asset like the US dollar. Next up, we've got the pipes, and I like to draw an analogy between these kind of companies and the types of businesses that sprung up during the gold rush of 1849. So people you know, flocked out to the, gold, the West Coast to look for gold, and then you had companies like Levi's springing up to provide the blue jeans or people starting tooling businesses to give people the tools that they needed to dig into the ground. So the pipes companies are similar. And these are companies that are providing the infrastructure or technology that's facilitating all of these financial services transactions and applications. And they're doing this mainly through APIs. So they're really in the background. But what they're doing is enabling virtually any software company to offer financial products directly to their end consumers through embedded fintech. And then the last category we'll talk about are our disruptors, our challengers, our favorite tech word. So the fintech revolution of the early 2000s, as I said before, was characterized by innovations in consumer focused payments and peer to peer lending. So they focused on creating customer experiences that were more transparent, more accessible, seamless, and uh, most importantly, very cost effective. So looking forward, ex uh, experts expect to see more B2B focused disruption than before. And honestly, just straight invention uh, focused on infrastructure and the power of blockchain and open banking, all things we'll touch on uh, in the tech section of this webinar. So up next is fintech sectors. So if we go one layer down into these broad strokes, Finstroke, oh, sorry, broad strokes, fintech categories, we're gonna to start to run into different sectors offering a variety of financial services, and we're gonna highlight a couple different ones today. So fintech 101, characterized by focus on the consumer, offering a better customer experience or an experience void of a bank-like financial institution entirely. So retail and commercial banking, so often referred to as challenger banks, these were born right out of the 2008 financial crisis. Um, they're often customer centric, mobile first, cloud based banks, and they're everywhere across the UK and Singapore. My bank over here in London is Monzo, um, classic challenger bank. Next up, we've got crowdfunding. So this is the funding of a project or campaign by collecting many smaller donations from multiple individual donors instead of having to rely on large donations from one or two supporters. Um, in a similar vein, we've got peer-to-peer -peer lending. So this enables individuals to obtain loans from other individuals and cut out the financial institution as the middleman uh, for, for loans and credit. And personal finance. So thanks to open banking, you can now use a service like Mint um, to connect all of your bank accounts for this more holistic view into your money across, uh, across accounts and companies and stock trading. So before the rise of fintech, individual investors had to spend weeks or months analyzing data for the optimum investment strategy or paying someone else to do it. 
So fintech is using big data and machine learning technologies to simplify the pro uh, simplify the process and provide investors like you and me with relevant data and the ability to buy and trade within seconds. And so moving into our fintech for the future, um, we'll talk about blockchain and crypto first. So crypto, like Bitcoin, is still a very highly speculative investment at this point, despite what Elon Musk may lead you to believe. Blockchain, though, that underlying technology is really where the biggest potential is. And there's many applications in the fintech sector of this distributed ledger technology, um, which includes things like fund transfers and settling trades. Um, but outside of fintech, we'll see it in use for things like voting and contracts and, and tons of other uses. Mobile banking essentially turns a user's mobile calling account into a place to store and pay out money and use USSD based services, which use an even more basic part of a phone's communications infrastructure to send messages and money. Africa is the global leader in mobile money, and we're seeing cooperative competition between banks, telecommunications companies or telcos and fintechs across the continent in offering new services for consumers with an increasing number of smartphones. Next up, we'll talk about remittances services. So the term remittance derives from the word remit, which means to send back. And a remittance refers to an amount of money transferred or sent from one party to another, usually overseas. Right now, traditional brick and mortar remittance services like Western Union are seeing a lot of competition from apps like TransferWise or World Remit, who offer more transfer options at a marginal cost per transfer. Uh, per transfer. Then we've got digital identity verification. So in order to use a financial service, the bank or institution or fintech needs to know that you are who you say you are and that you're not involved in any sort of shady or nefarious act, uh, monetary activities. This is big business for fintechs who need to get you using their services ASAP, lest you download a different challenger bank instead who make it easier for you to send money in the next five minutes. And they're doing this using app uh, face scanning tech and AI to do this in minutes and not days. So insurance tech, insure tech, uh, insure tech companies are disrupting this very traditional industry using big data and deep learning trained AI to do everything from risk modeling, detecting fraud, automating the processing of insurance claims and finding the right mix of policies to offer an individual for coverage. And we'll talk about robo-advising up next, which is another thing kind of like stock trading that once required a real life human um, and is now being replaced with algorith algorithmic asset-based recommendation and wealth management at a fraction of the cost and sometimes no human touch at all. So big banks like Schwab have invested in robo-advisors and fintechs like Elvest have completely productized it and tweaked their algorithms for the life cycles of women specifically. And the last uh, fintech sector that we will talk about is paytech or payments as a service. And this includes everything from point of sale or POS devices, chip cards, mobile wallets, even sound wave based payments, which I should probably do a whole other webinar on. Um, then you have cloud based payments as a service platforms offering an array of individual payment services that can be delivered to end users via API. So payment as a service companies take care of all of that underlying infrastructure, compliance and security so that market merchants can just accept money and consumers can just pay. All right, so we've definitely delved into a lot of theory and history around fintech. So let's talk about some real live fintech companies. As I mentioned earlier, Paystack is a startup out of Lagos that provides online payment facilities to merchants via API and a few lines of code. They were the first Nigerian startup to complete the prestigious San Francisco based Y Combinator, which is basically the Harvard of starter, uh, startup accelerators. And startup accelerators, if you're not familiar with them, are basically startup boot camps for early stage companies where founders get mentorship and financing to hopefully accelerate the growth and success of their business. But before Paystack's big American acquisition by Stripe, it built its importance as a premier African-founded, African-focused fintech. Specifically, 
Its focus is on integrating the wide range of payment options important to Nigerians and people across many different African countries where uh, more people remain unbanked. And this uh, primary option is really most notably mobile banking. World Remit is a cross-border payments company that provide international money transfer and remittance services in more than 130 companies, countries, and over 70 currencies. Founder Ismail Ahmed has a really interesting backstory in that he fled Somaliland in 1988 to the UK, where he worked odd jobs like strawberry picking in the English countryside. His family remained in a refugee camp in Ethiopia, and the exorbitant fees he paid to send money back to them did not sit well. Neither did the corruption he witnessed while eventually working as an advisor to the UN's money transfer division, which he reported as a whistleblower and subsequently lost his job. After gaining an MBA and a settlement for the, from the UN for unfair treatment, he founded World Remit to reduce the cost of money transfers and remittances and increase transparency for consumers and governments alike. And finally, Rye Capital. Micro, small, and medium enterprises account for 99% of the total businesses in Cambodia, with most businesses being micro enterprises with fewer than 10 employees. In terms of getting a bank, sorry, in terms of getting a loan from a bank in the city, there are many barriers. Traveling from a rural area to the city, applying for the loan, waiting weeks for approval. So instead, Rye Capital have developed a peer-to-peer -peer or P2P lending platform on a mobile app that allows individuals and businesses to apply for a loan at their fingertips in a marketplace platform where individual or corporate investors from inside or outside Cambodia can crowdfund that loan. So this brings us to the end of the fin. We've talked history, we've talked broad strokes categories, individual sectors within uh, fintech, and then we've talked about a couple different companies. So next up is going to be the tech.